All right, so, but also on the Saturday is the celebration. Everyone say celebration. Now, although we're celebrating Life Church and it's bigger than just us, I just want to make this point. It is actually for us. Everyone say for us. For For this group of people right here. We're celebrating us. We're celebrating the birth of something happened 20 years ago and has now affected people all around the world. But it's for us. It's for our family. We're not, we're not doing strong pushes, trying to, people, to get people to fly in from out of the country. We want to celebrate us. We want to celebrate what God has said, what God has done, where we are and where we're going. All right, so it's going to be at the barn. Everyone say barn. If you've been there before, you can come to the barn again. And we are, as Mel said, we're going to have, we're going to have it catered in. We're going to have bouncy cars and lots of stuff for the kids. Um, and we're going to play games and we're just going to have... It's just going to be a great time. We're going to fellowship and have a laugh together. All right? So if you can, I don't know how Mel asked us to do that, but sign up. And, um, and it's going to be a great weekend. All right? Okay. Lily's coming. Thank you. I'm glad you're coming, Lily. All right. Can you turn in your Bibles to Proverbs? If you have a Bible with you, Proverbs chapter 3. You're going to look at two scriptures, and then we're going to jump in. Proverbs chapter 3. It says, in all your ways, everybody say all, all. your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Amen. All right. Holy Spirit. I ask right now that you would fill this room, that you would open, as Paul prayed, the eyes of our hearts so that we can know you better and the hope to which you've called in each and every one of us. Holy Spirit, I ask that today you would enter our hearts in a fresh way through revelation in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. The title of my message today, and I don't know how far I'm going to get, so I'm going to probably do this in a few parts, um, but it's very simple, and it's these three words. Are you ready? Let Jesus in. Will you say that with me? Let Jesus in. I listened to Talia's message, which was so good. From Was it last week Talia speak, spoke? Yeah, last week. Um, fantastic. I was, she, she is a tremendous speaker. Where are you, Talia? Amen. Talia, can we just give up for Talia? That was a great word. It was a strong word. We then gathered some leaders, young leaders, and um, in, in our community here. And my brother Jonathan this week just shared his heart. And again, I just felt like, man, I felt pierced in my heart. I thought, wow. Holy Spirit, you're doing something deep. Holy Spirit, you're going somewhere. Holy Spirit, you're after something amongst your people, and you're not going to let this go. You know, so often we live a cyclical life because God just takes us round and round the mountain until we actually listen, and we don't have to do laps. If we listen and let Jesus in and say, okay, Lord Jesus, I let you into this area of my life, then we can continue to grow. And that's really what I want to talk about today and the next few times that I speak. I want to talk about letting Jesus in. The other scripture is in Luke chapter 4. If you can turn there with me, Luke chapter 4 and verse, I think it's verse 30. No, sorry, did I say 4? Luke chapter 24. And, this, and it says this. It was here earlier today. Here it is. And when they were at the table, sorry, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. It's really important. Then he began to, it, then he, and, and it began, and he began to give the, sorry, I need a new glasses again. Okay. No, these are the ones that don't work. <laughs> That's worse. These are new. Now everything's just foggy. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then their eyes were opened. <laughs> and they reported to him. And he disappeared from their sight. 
And they asked each other, were, watch this, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us along the road and opened the scriptures to us? Wow. He breaks bread. Their hearts burn, another translation says, were warmed because he opened up the scriptures to them and their eyes were opened. I could talk about that for a month. Wow. Breaking bread, talking about the scriptures, hearts opened, warmed, and a left burning. When was the last time you walked along the street and your heart was burning? Because you've been with him. And you know what? This is where I think God has is, is got a tracking device on our hearts right now. I was walking through, just went for a walk yesterday with our dog. Really takes me for a long walk. But, uh, but I, felt, I felt glimpses of this. God is just burning. He's wanting our attention. And that's what I want to talk about. So put your hand on your heart again. I'm going to pray again. Holy Spirit, again, we just thank you for our hearts. Thank you for every opportunity we have to hear your word, every opportunity we have to change. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for everyone in this room, including myself. I ask that this today, you would just, you would just help us to become more like you. Help us for our hearts to be, to, for things to be taken out, for things to be put in, to be realigned and corrected. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine a house. Okay, can you imagine a house? Everybody got a picture of your house in your head? Now, I want you to imagine quickly the different rooms that are in a house. And now I want you to imagine that this house belongs to God. This is God's house. And in this, so this house is really a spiritual house. This house is alive. Every room is alive. It's a house that is living. It's a house that's buzzing. It's a house that's just like electric. It's God's house, and it's a spiritual house. And today, I want to just break down different rooms in this house. And my hope is that by the end, that when we break bread together, that God will be, Jesus will be burning in our hearts because we've let him in. Let him into every room in our hearts, or at least began the process of recognition that perhaps there are rooms in my life, because I live in this spiritual house, that have been closed or filled with other clutter and stuff, and so Jesus can't get in, or I won't let him in, or I forgot about that room a long time ago, and Jesus is saying, I want you to let me in. All right, so you can imagine the spiritual house. Okay, so the first one. The first one, there's seven rooms. In John 14, Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. And I go and prepare a place for you. Another, another passage says this, and each room is, I love this because I'm a little bit crazy and uh, I've been accused of being a little eccentric. And, um, but this is my, one of my favorite scriptures. It says, and in there, the rooms are full. Okay, that's okay if you like lots of full. So if you're a minimalistic, that's not like God. Because these rooms are full, ready, of rare and interesting things. Yes, yes, that's what God's house is like. So if you're a minimalist, that's just you. Okay, so here we go. House, the room number one, ready? Room number one, the kitchen. Everyone say kitchen. kitchen. Track with me and I'll go quick. Kitchen, kitchen. All right. Kitchen is a place, is it not, of preparation? Yes. It's also a place of like decisions. Things, things happen in the kitchen. Like it's kind, of, it's kind of the heart of the home. People gather in the kitchen for some reason. Now in our house, every time Katie, who led the meeting today, comes, we're like, oh no, Katie's coming. Because if you go to Katie's house, everything is so clean. I mean, that, Katie and Archie's house, it's like, it, it just looks like a show home. But ours looks like, it just, it doesn't look like a show home. You walk in and there's just... Just, you know, the, 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 the rugs sideways, and then there's just shoes. People's shoes, I don't even know whose they are, but they wouldn't fit anyone in our family. People just left them there, and then we just left them there. And then we have a dog, so there's just things that have been chewed up and stains, and then you just walk through to the, to the kitchen, opens up, and it's just, 
you know, there's stuff, there's tools on the island because I live there. And <laughs> they're right next to the bills, and ne- which is next to a Bible, which is next to a cat dish, which the dog chewed. And then it's just, it's just like that. It, we just live like that. We have lots of people over, and we're like, hey, sorry the house isn't spick and span. We live here. And that's just that's all we've got. We re- live busy lives, and you've probably said, yeah, that is pretty how you live. But <laughs> stuff happens in the kitchen. Stuff happens there. Is, is that the same in your house? It's kind of like the center point. It's just like that. That's where everybody gathers. It's the center of the home. It's where activity happens. It's where there's prep, food preparation, where food is prepared, fruit is stored, food is consumed, where things are thrown out. I want you again to imagine that this is a spiritual house. Imagine it from a spiritual perspective. Do you remember the story of Martha and Mary and they are with Jesus and Martha is in the kitchen and she is so busy, she's doing all this stuff. And Mary wasn't pulling her weight. And so she starts to complain, Martha did, and said that that Mary wasn't pulling her weight. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, Martha, Martha, why do you worry about so many things? Ready, watch this. Only one thing. Say one thing. Only one thing is required. And I'm telling you, Martha, Mary chose that which was better. And I want to provoke us that in the business of life, in this room called the kitchen, this room in our house where so much activity happens, that I want to provoke us that in all our ways, we acknowledge him in that space, in the place of preparation, in this place of consumption, in the place of the most activity, and if you live like me, the most mess that we allow Jesus in and acknowledge him in that space in our lives, like Jesus pushed the issue with with Martha, will you let me in because you're so busy doing other things? And I'm just going to say this because... I hope it will help someone, but I always find it very profound that Jesus is actually pushing back on Martha, saying, Martha, you're so busy giving me something that you think I want, but actually I don't. People get offended when they give to people things that they never required or asked for. And so when we let Jesus into this space and he starts to move stuff around and clear stuff, he's like, hey, I want to move this around because you're carrying a fence there because you're trying to do something that was never required of you. Often we give gifts to people that we think that they would like. And then we're aware of take offense because they don't appreciate it to the level of which we thought they should when we gave it. Perhaps, maybe, it was just never required. Number two, the family room. Everyone say, family room. You may call it a living room. You may call it a great room. You may call it a no room, a cluttered room, a room that only you go in. But the family room, it's a family room. The family room is a place of conversation. It's a place of communication. It's a place of conflict, potentially. It's that room off the kitchen where you, where you live, where you hang out where you have fun, where you relax, where you unwind, where you play games, where you watch movies. It's where you chill out. And in that room in your life, imagine for a moment that space in your life where those activities take place. And then ask yourself this question, Will I let Jesus in? Is Jesus there? Do I acknowledge him? Do I make myself aware of him in that space? In the space of communication? In the space of relaxation? In the space of having fun? He is right there. He is fully present in that space. 
But so often we can just go along and just forget it because of the busyness of stuff just happening. I was with someone this week and they were talk I was talking to them about time and time management. And I think I said it recently that if we don't act on what we do know, we become paralyzed by what we don't know. And paralysis sets in when we don't do what we should be doing. Stress is caused by not doing what we should be doing. And I was talking to them about things, idols in their life without... By the way, an idol is anything or anyone that replaces God at your core. An idol is anything or anyone that replaces God at your core. And th you, could, you need to decide, is there an idol in my life in this space where I live, in the living room of my life, where so much activity happens, some of my recreation, so much of my relaxation? And anyway, I was talking to this person, and I think maybe they need to cut some things out, and because procrastination is real. And we can just push things down, push things down. And I thought, in, you know, my inner voice was like, I'm actually like this. This probably, probably, I can't speak too much into this because I am guilty of procrastination. I am guilty of just pushing things, kicking the can down the road. I'll do it later. And then on the other hand, I'm an executor. Let's do this right now. So I'm trying to figure this out by myself. And then I went home and I thought, oh, I have got this show on Netflix that I love to watch. This is last week. And I was talking to this person about this show. And they love this show also. But the only thing is, Fee doesn't like this show. Uh, she doesn't. I don't know why. I'm not going to tell you what the show is because I don't want you to judge me. But <laughs> Fee doesn't like it. And I don't think it's sinful. I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's ungodly. It's just about breaking out of prison, right? So, so I like this show, right? But Fee doesn't like the show. So if I want to watch this show, I have to go somewhere on my own. And then I realize this show has many seasons. I'm like, oh, Lord, is this ever going to end? But it's just so intense. And it's just so, there's always a disaster. And as I went back to my room, because V doesn't want to hear this show because it's got guns and stuff, right? <laughs> I felt the Holy Spirit hold me to the same account of what I've just told someone else that they should do. Now, there is in itself absolutely nothing right. wrong with this show. It was a great show. I enjoyed the show. But when I actually looked at my time consumption and the things that I should be doing because that I'm not doing, because I'm doing this, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, will you let me in? Uh, no, this is my quiet time. This is my relaxation time. This is my downtime. I'm an introvert. Wait, Lord, you know this because you made me that way. <laughs> and you know what? I said, Lord, I want to be so radical for you. And I just hit off. And I thought, I'm done. And last week, I just went cold turkey. Just I'm not going to watch that show anymore. But listen, Hebrews says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And run the race with perseverance, the race that has been marked out for you. And I thought, sometimes we can miss the markers. Because we don't realize, that it's not everything is just sin. It's just stuff. Everything that hinders. And I thought, this is becoming a hindrance. Please hear me. I am not being legalistic. I am not saying you need to stop doing watching Netflix. I am not. Some of you need to chill out more. In fact, some of you need to leave the kitchen and go into the living room and put your feet up and learn to chill out. Some people need to learn just to relax because you're so busy, 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 busy. That room has now so become a part of who you are, you fail to realize there are actually other rooms to explore and other spaces to enjoy and places to allow Jesus in. Number three is the bathroom. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is the room where we get rid of stuff. <laughs> uh, Fee and I recently opened up an Airbnb um, and uh, we, last night was the first night. We were so excited. And so I knew I'd got time that, to prepare. I don't do things on a Saturday night because I like to just be, spend time with the Lord and just be quiet, getting ready for Sunday morning and 
gathering my thoughts together, and we were so excited at four o'clock, there were eight people going to this new Airbnb, and they were the first guests, and we had no reviews, and they're in there for about one hour, and then Fee gets a call, and it says, there is a problem. The toilet has backed up. I'm like, then just tell them to flush it. They went, they did. Here's the picture. And I don't want to be too graphic. But every shower, bath, tub, and toilet in that house backed up with sewage. Okay. Now, I have to live what I preach, and I said to you recently, none of these things move me. So I went and sat down. I thought, I'm not moved by this. This could be bad. Actually, it could be really bad. Because not only will they give us a bad review on our first one, but then we won't be able to charge them but we'll also be on the hook to do the right thing to put them in a hotel. They've traveled a long way in. And so this is going through my head. So I'm like, okay, I've got to sort this out. So I went down and we got it all sorted out. And eventually they rotted the lines and I said, what was wrong with it? He said, something 60 feet away got jammed and now it's unjammed. And I said, and what caused that? They said, roots. Now this morning I was thinking about this. And I just want to say this to you, no matter how beautiful the rooms in your house are, no matter how beautiful your house is, and no matter how good it looks on Instagram, if you don't deal with the roots in your life, they will cause that which was meant to be sent away from your house, waste, to back up into your house, and there will be nothing that house is useless. I can't have guests with no running water, with no sinks and no toilets and no showers. There's no way around of it. You're going into a hotel, but by the grace of God, he flushed it. And I said, what is it with roots? This has been my last 20 years, houses with roots. And I said, there's not even any trees here. He said, roots, even once trees have been cut down, the roots will still grow for 10 years. Church, we need to go deep. And allow the Holy Spirit, Jesus, to go deep. Say, go down to these deep, these deep roots because I don't want the stuff, hello, in my life to back up. Number four. The bedroom. Not going to spend too much time on this. My brother talked about this, about letting God into our sleep. The sleep of the righteous, the Bible says, is sweet. Do we allow Holy Spirit? Do we allow Jesus? Do we ask him, Jesus, will you come into my bedroom? A bedroom is a place. It's kind of where you're vulnerable, is it not? When you sleep, you're vulnerable. That's why we need to allow Jesus into our sleep to allow that sleep to be good and deep. It's a place where we bathe. It's a place where we dress. It's a place of intimacy. It's a place of vulnerability Will we let Jesus into that room in our life? Say, Jesus, come in. In a minute, we're going to break bread. And we're going to ask Jesus to come into these areas of our life. And this is for you. This is for me. Number five, six, five. Is the study or office. Anyone have a study in your house? Ever have an office? Anyone have a den, a place where you go? Maybe it's your secret place. But for me, mine is kind of dual. I have... have my personal study where all my Bibles are and my, my concordances and, 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 it's, and I have my chair where I sit and spend time with the Lord. But it's also a place where I pay all my bills. <laughs> it's also a place where the mail ends up once it's been sitting on our counter with everything else on our counter for a few weeks. It ends up in my office. It's a place of planning. It's a place of decisions. Some of us need to spend less time in perhaps the living room or the kitchen or the bedroom sleeping and spend some time in the study. Spend some time in the Word. Spend some time planning. Spend some time thinking. Spend some time strategizing. 
spend some time finding a strategy for your life, for your family, for your wife, for your husband, for your children. One of the most challenging things my dad ever said to me is he said, son, do you know which way your children should go? Train a child in the way they should go. You train your child in the way they should go. And when we let Jesus into every area of our life, from strategic planning to giving to whatever it is, he starts to make our path straight. Amen. And things that were crooked will straighten out. Things that were confusing will suddenly make sense because of a simple act of obedience. Jesus, I'm letting you into this area of my life. I'm letting you into my finances. I was talking with Isaac last night. We were talking about the principles of sowing and reaping and how you can't outgive God. And the Bible says he gives seed for sowing and bread for food. And Isaac said this. He said, many people don't get seed to sow. They only ever get bread to eat. Because God will feed us, but he won't give us seed to sow because we've not sown. He gives bread for eating and seed for sowing. Watch this. The principle of the Spirit is whatever a man sows, that he will reap. So if you sow seed, you reap that seed. If you sow money, you reap money. If you sow joy, you reap joy. If you sow bitterness, you you reap bitterness. If you sow anger, you reap anger. Whatever you sow, you reap. It's a principle of the Spirit. Seed time and harvest, the Bible says in Genesis, will never cease. It will never cease. I encourage you in your planning, in your thinking, to think, this is, someone said to me the other day, that was so generous of you. And I just said, it actually wasn't my money. They went, wait, what? what? You gave me something that didn't belong to you? I said, no, it, w- <laughs> it was, but God gave it to me as seed to sow. <laughs> I, I don't get to eat it. Because if I ate its seed that God gave me to sow, then the seed starts to dry up. But the more I sow, the more he gives me seed to sow. So I just sow this seed, and he goes, well done, gives me more. And then people are like, wow, where would you get all that seed from? It's like he just gives it to me to sow. And then this seed is over for here for eating. He gives us bread for food. Church, I'm just provoking you in your thinking, in your planning, that we let God in and acknowledge him. Lord, I acknowledge you with my paycheck. I acknowledge you. Some of these things are so basic, but in Revelation it says you've forgotten your first love. Go back and do the things you did at first. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Remember Jesus. I forgot that actually everything that you have, you, 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 it belongs to you. And Lord, I trust you with my tithe. I trust you with my offering. And Lord, I want to be a giver. And I want to be a sower. By the way, there's no such thing as a big tither. You're either a tither or you're not. That's right. You either say, Lord, this belongs to you. I think God's a genius the way he does that. <laughs> because it is my only. That's why the widow's might meant so much. The issue wasn't what she had, it's what she had left. She gave it all. And the Lord said, look, I'm telling you, she gave more. You follow? Is this okay? Too direct for a Sunday morning? No. But church, these are basic things, really. They're just allowing Jesus into every area of our life. All right. Okay, study. Number six, the garage. Maybe you're in a, a garage. 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 I'll be really vulnerable. We have a two-car garage, and we have never had one car in it. <laughs> and sometimes I see people's garages, and they've got, they've got like, you know, they've got acid-stained floors. They've got epoxy floors. They've painted. I mean, it's just, 
they got a perfect fridge. I mean, it's nicer than our kitchen. <laughs> and their cars live there, and their cars are pristine. And I'm like, I just don't know how you do it. How do you not live with this clutter? Maybe it's just because I buy clutter. I don't know. But we just have stuff. There's just always stuff, like boxes and just... You know, bits of lawnmowers and <laughs> snowblowers that I never use, and then another lawnmower that doesn't work, and then a rider lawnmower that I just found on this. I don't know, and then bikes. But just stuff, right? There's just, there's just stuff in my garage, like a lot of stuff. Like I have to pull the door down and just hope it will just won't pop open. But it's that. But we, we put stuff in the garage, but some of it is really important, and to me it's important. But some of it we have to keep. I have to keep my tax returns for like how many years? Three years, so I've got them boxed somewhere. Um, but uh, but I seven. Oh gosh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but their boxes there, like okay, they're all labeled, and and then people are like, what a mess. Why don't you clean this out? Because I know where everything is. I put it there, and it's really important to me. And then every fall, and it's coming up, which is why I thought of it. It's, I don't do it in the spring for some reason because the summer just gets messy. So I do it in the fall, and before it gets winter, that's when I do my big clear out. So it's coming up. But I just wanted to say, church, there are certain things in our lives that are important. But they're so cluttered with other things that we were temporarily important, like prophetic words, promises, things that we've stored in our heart, that we've stored in a box in a garage. And it's important to us. Maybe we don't want to open it because I don't know if I can hear any more disappointment. I don't know if that word has gone past its best buy, sell by date. And so, Lord, maybe I'm just going to leave it there in the box and hopefully someone will just throw it away and I'll be like, oh well, I don't want to. But I, and suddenly our life is so cluttered. And I just want to provoke us just let Jesus in. Let's let him in today. When we break bread, it says oh, their hearts were warm as they walked along the street. And when I was walking along, walking the dog yesterday, all I, all I had yesterday was this. Lord, will you warm our hearts? Will you warm our hearts? They said, didn't our hearts burn when he talked with us? I thought, oh. being yanked along by the dog, I'm like, my heart's getting warm. As I'm walking through this park, by your goodness to me, Lord, I want to let you in. There's areas in my life, maybe I'll tell you sometime, but just areas I'm like, no, that's definitely not an issue. And it's like, yeah, it actually is. And finally, I'm going to end with this one, number seven. I want you to imagine God's house now. Just for a moment, imagine God's house. Because we're a spiritual house. And God's house is made up of living stones. And he's building a house where he can make his presence and live amongst his people. But I'm going to end with this one. Because if you think about it, primarily... Our experience of church, and I'm not saying this is right, is living room, right? Maybe kitchen, but primarily, we as a congregation, those sitting in this room, listening right here, right now, I know it's Labor Day weekend, and people are gone, and people are traveling, but primarily, our biggest event is living room. We come together and we sit. We come together, we talk, we communicate. And on a Sunday morning, because we want to live by the word of God, the Bible says when you come together, each one has something, and there's a tongue and a hymn and, a, and an interpretation and a word of instruction. And this, Paul says, must be done for the strengthening of the church. And so we move in the gifts, and we celebrate that because it's a part of our culture. But let me ask you, and I want to just correct something here, like a chiropractor. All right? And I'm asking you, don't take offense. How dare you? I, I want to help us. Okay? I want to help us. But imagine if you have a living room, and that's where you live, and then people are coming in that you don't know. Some of them Christians, some of them neighbors, some of them people, and they just heard that there's something going on, and so they come into this house, and they're in your living room. 
Now, we have people come into this house, people who are saved, people who've known the Lord for a long time, but we also have people that don't know anything about God. They come for the first time. Even when you're asked, are you a visitor? Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I'm not putting up my hand. I don't even know where I am. I don't even know what's going on. I've never been in a meeting like this in my life. Maybe you're hiding and you're just like, you've been away from God and you're, you're hiding here and it's a good place because it's a little bit darker and the worship's playing and I, I can just hide. I just want to say that's okay. You can hide here. This is a place where you can come and meet God. I know countless people that have come here and sat quietly. They've sat, they've sat quietly. And they said, we came to Life Church for a while. And we, we, we arrived late and left early because we just wanted to be in the presence of God. And I said, I'm okay with that. I'm nearly done. Stay with me. I know I've got some competition. There's people looking for hope. There's people excited about worship. People coming, needing healing. People needing purpose. People needing community. All kinds of people. So I want to say this to you. When we meet together, ask yourself this question. How self-aware am I? Am I aware of my environment? Am I aware of that this in this room are people like what I just said? And so in my excitement about or joy or pleasure that I have to move in my gifts, maybe that person doesn't understand that. Someone said to me, well, this person, this was years ago, if you back them into a corner, oh, then you really find out what's inside of them. I said, what if you just didn't back them into a corner? <laughs> there should be such a place of love here, but that means honor and caring for people. May, you know, some people don't like to be hugged. They just don't like it. Well, why? None of your business. Yeah. So maybe if you find out that person doesn't like to be hugged. Don't hug them. Hello. It's called honor. We're honor. We, we honor because we're honorable. So we're going to care for that person. How about this moving in, in our gifts, in words of knowledge, in, in prophetic words? There is a time and a place for that. But ask the person, could I share this with you? I feel like God, and don't talk in so much Christianese that you assume that they know what you're talking about. Because it might be really simple to you, but to them, they're just really confused because you're praying in an unknown tongue and they don't know what that is. Right? So help, but it's an awareness. We're talking about the living room in God's house now. This is what I'm talking about. We're going to end it in this. But I think this is really important. That's why Paul says, let everything be done in decency and in order. I, oh, I, many years ago, I was asked to, actually I asked, to look after two people, Bill Johnson and Reinhard Bonnke, at the Allstate Arena. And I ended up getting this great privilege to do this. And so there was 15,000 people in the Allstate Arena and I'm stood between Bill and Reinhardt. And my job is to just care for them. Drive them around, take them out for dinner, look after them, make sure they've got everything that they need. And then, then there's this lady who will remain nameless, but she's now my friend, who is very upset because while 15,000 people were worshiping God, uh, she clearly felt it was my responsibility to make everyone around Bill and Reinhardt be quiet. And just worship, because they were talking. So I'm stood there, and I'm like, she's going, shh, be quiet. Tell me to be quiet. I'm like, you want me to tell 15,000 people to be quiet? Why? It's an all-state arena. They're not bothering anyone. They can just talk. The worship's loud. People are chatting. 
And then, so I just kind of pretended to worship, which apparently I'm not going to do, because like, I've got stuff to do. And so she came up, tapped him on the shoulder. Bill's just like this. In fact, if you look at the video, the CD is called The Awakening or something like that. There's Bill worshipping, and then there's just me going, uh, like, uh, just, I'm trying to be helpful. Anyway, so, so I'm worshipping, and she grabs me, and she goes, I told you, make everyone be quiet. I'm like, uh, I said, Why? She said, because. And regardless of what you think of Bill Johnson, this is very powerful. She said, the culture of worship that we've created is this is the only part of the meeting that is just for Jesus. Everything else is for us. And so let's clear the atmosphere of just talking and drinking coffee, laughing, and let's just wholeheartedly worship the king and let him in. I'm like, okay, I'll try, I'll try to do that then. 15,000 people. So I went, hey, you lot, shut up. Right? Hey, you lot, shut up. Everybody shut up. Worship the Lord. <laughs> Anyway, something shifted. Not because I did that, but something shifted. And there's been very few times in my life where the holiness and reverence of God came in the room. As 15,000. The worship stopped. It went way beyond the worship. Some of you are in the room. And we just sang, holy, holy, worthy, glory. All the musicians were just on their knees. No one's playing. It's like, you know, when my worship goes beyond the song and beyond the musicians, and it's just like, and I'm like, I get it. I'm saying that just to say this. Can we be a people that, that acknowledge the Lord, and in that part of our gatherings, we do it with all of our heart? I was challenged this morning. You know, I, 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 can, I, can, I, I can find it easy to, because I love excellence, right? I not in my kitchen, but everywhere else, or my garage. <laughs> but I, I do, but when I don't see it in certain areas of my life, I just, it annoys me. And, but with worship, I then start worshipping worship. <laughs> or scoring worship or grading worship, rather than just saying, Lord, I'm just here to worship you. Right. So I'll end there with this. Can we not be talking... Praying, prophesying, talking, side discussions, when we're just here to worship the Lord. In those times, you may have a word for someone, you may have a tongue interpretation, you may even have an interpretive dance. Could you hold it? Especially the interpretive dance. Yeah. But just hold it till the end of the meeting. And let's just find an honor with one of people. Be sensitive to people where they're at. You may not know. I've been clumsy in my life, treading into places and thinking I should have been more sensitive. I didn't know that's where you were at. I didn't know that was your experience. Will you please forgive me? Amen. Yes. Church, can we all stand together? Just put your hands up like this. A tree can come. Or where's the tree? Do some musicians. Is Isaac still here? Oh. Let's just have this moment. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Open your hearts. You know, we lift our hands to say so it's a sign of surrender. In every nation on earth, we, people put their hands up. It's like, I surrender. That's it. We also lift up our hands to say, Lord, will you cleanse these hands? It opens, keeps us vulnerable when our arms are open. Because the vital organ of our heart is now exposed. But just close your eyes and, you know, some of you need to train yourself, as I do, to acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways. And you can start right here, right now, by saying, Lord, with my eyes closed and my hands open, 
I open my heart to you, Lord Jesus. I open my heart to you, Lord Jesus. Here's this heart of mine. For some of you, it might be helpful to identify a room. that you've not let Jesus in. A space where you've not let him in. Say, Jesus. Say it out loud, just to him. Just to him, say, Jesus. And fill in the blank. I let you in to this room. I let you in to this area of my life. I open the door. I want to invite you once you're ready. Don't rush. Don't open your eyes and start moving to for communion. But when you're ready, go and take the communion. Take it back. Break bread with someone. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you today, that when we break bread, having heard your word and your scriptures, that our hearts would begin to burn. They'd start by being warm. But Lord, as we open doors, as we open spaces, as we open rooms, until all the rooms of our life are open, that you'll find in this house and these people, in us, in me, a burning people. A burning people. say anything else I want us to stay in this moment with Jesus I want us to stay in this moment where you're locked until until you let him in and when you're ready come and break bread just come forward I'm going to close the meeting I'm just going to ask Tree to continue to play If you need to go and get your kids, please do. Totally get it. But church, let's let him in this week. Let's acknowledge him in all of our ways. And he will.